Okay. So if a car takes a bent curve at less than the ideal speed, friction is need needed to keep it from sliding toward the inside of the curve. I guess that's right. Um, yeah, if it's standing still, it would slide kind of in towards the yeah, inside of the curve. So it says calculate the ideal speed to take it and what is the minimum coefficient of friction needed for a frightened driver. So I'll do both parts. Part A will kind of naturally um, show what the frictionless version looks like because um, the ideal speed actually has friction force going to zero. So this is the picture you should have in mind. Um, so this is one of those where to represent the full set of information, you really need two views. You need a top view, which will show you the curvature of the road and kind of um, the, how the car is moving. If it looks like I'm basically drawing the same picture that I drew for the train, yeah, it kind of is. Um, but the rear view will now look more interesting because I now have to draw the banked uh, curve. So, um, so you are imagining looking at this car from the back, you are maybe standing here and you're looking at the car, then you will have the cross section of the road which will uh, give you that banked angle theta. And um, this would be sort of, sorry, we're present the car is a box. But this is what the car will be like. It's going into the page. So, all right. And um, so, yeah, <laughs> so let me draw a free body diagram. Try to talk about um, the interactions without <laughs> there being a free body diagram. So the free body diagram of the car looks like this. There is no force along the direction of movement because it's moving at, uh, I'm assuming it's moving at constant speed. This is the ideal. So the only forces um, necessary are kind of within this plane of rear view. That's why we draw this rear view at all. So um, I like to draw gravity first. You always have gravity, mg. And here, what's uh, keeping the car from accelerating downward is actually this surface here. And because that is at an angle, theta, normal force has to be in this direction. And oh, oh, and that actually goes with uh, there, because uh, this car is moving in a circle, it needs to have centripetal acceleration. So the way the forces are arranged here, you can arrange it in such a way that there's no acceleration in the vertical direction, but there's a horizontal acceleration towards the center of the circle. So yeah, so all this seems fine. Let me kind of draw what the components of normal force would be. Here's the X component or what's going to become X. Here's the horizontal component and the vertical component. <laughs> Let me just move on to the second step in the standard strategy and draw my coordinate axis. So my coordinate axis will look like this. And this is actually the thing that uh, sometimes tricks a lot of people in dealing with a question like this is that despite the appearance of the inclined angle or inclined plane, because your acceleration is horizontal, your axis should also be straight, uh, horizontal and vertical. Just be mindful of that there. So let me just track this angle theta through different geometry. So that's the same angle theta here. This angle here is 90 degree minus theta. So what theta should be is actually this angle here. So that gives me this component, the X component as N sine theta, it's on the opposite side, and this angle is N Y is equal to N cosine theta. All right, uh, oh, and that's a step number three, <laughs> breaking down forces into components. Um, yeah, and uh, because it's uh, asking about ideal speed, where we kind of want friction force to be zero. Uh, that's all the forces there is. I don't need any other forces other than gravity and normal force. The normal force should be enough to allow the car to make that turn. 
So I'm done to step number one, two, three. Let me finally do step number four, which is writing down Newton's second law equations. So I'm gonna need to write down two equations, one for each dimension, one for X, one for Y. Net force in the X direction is going to give me uh, X component of force and sine theta is equal to mass times acceleration. And I recognize that it's a centripetal acceleration. So it's gonna be um, V squared over R. And in the Y direction, I have net force in the Y direction is equal to, I have two forces, the Y component of normal force and uh, cosine theta minus mg is equal to zero. All right, uh, I don't know why I drew this so low. Let me just move that up a little. Um, all right, I have two equations. Uh, let me count my unknowns. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, I don't know normal force. Um, I do know theta. Um, I do know radius. Um, oh, I don't know V. Oh, uh, yeah, V is what I'm solving for. So I don't know V. And I think uh, that's it. I have two unknowns and I have one, two equations. So once again, I'm taking stock of uh, my unknowns, two unknowns, and my information, one, two equations. I think I have everything I need. So, um, so let me go through that. So um, I guess what I'm going to do is I'm going to eliminate normal force solving this for V. So I'm going to go through the same steps I go through. I'm going to use substitution approach. Once again, you don't have to use substitution. There are other ways you can kind of do this more quickly. But the reason I like a substitution is because it's kind of standard approach you can use for 99% of the questions. And so even though it's sometimes a little bit more steps, it's kind of um, worth knowing the one boring vanilla way of doing everything. So I'm going to solve equation two for n. That gets me n is equal to mg divided by cosine theta. And this is going to become my tool, two prime, my tool for eliminating n normal force from my system of equations. So plugging two prime into one, this is what I'm going to get. One and two prime gets me um, mg sine, uh, mg over cosine theta times sine theta, that's the left-hand side, is equal to um, m v squared over r. Oh, I didn't even talk about m not being known, but uh, I kind of knew it was gonna cancel out, so. Um, all right, I guess I need to solve this for v. Let me solve it for v. So solving it for v, I have, um, V squared is equal to R times G. And this time I can actually write it as sine theta over cosine theta. But let me not do extra work and just write it as tangent theta. And uh, if I take square root, I can get rid of that square root sine theta. So for this scenario, what the speed should be is a square root of RG tangent theta. I think I have enough uh, to just plug in the numbers. Um, so let me do r 100 times g 9.8 times tangent theta and the way i plug it in in this calculator is first i enter the angle 21 and then i type tangent and i can kind of verify it's doing that correctly is equal to um oh that's the squared value so i need to take the square root of the whole thing okay so 19.39 or uh, 19.4 is what I need to do. Oh, that question, I think this question, we solved it for the rounding issue already. So, um, so this should be 19.4 uh, meters per second. 
So one of the things that, oops, not that question. One of the things we are trying to solve um, or issue that we are trying to anticipate and um, kind of head off from the beginning is for questions like this, uh, I want you to be able to use G equals 10 because I think that's a kind of better habit to build. So um, for the questions where we have fixed the rounding issues, you can actually do something like this. I can do R. 100 times g instead of 9.8, I can use 10 times a tangent of that angle. So it'll be 21 degrees um, of ten, tangent of that. Okay, equals, take the square root of that. And it gets me 19.6. And it's more than one digit away from that. And But if I put that in, it should have still grade it as correct, 19.6. Yeah. So really what we want to focus on is your problem solving approach, not whether you know where to round and or whether you know you can use calculator to plug in G equals 9.8. Uh, so that's uh, the easier part of the question. And the reason I wanted to do this question in particular is because it has this part to be where you now have to worry about friction. So it says, uh, what is the minimum coefficient of friction needed for a frightened driver to take, take the same curve at this speed? And let me use all from alpha to 20 kilometers per hour is 5.55, so this is 5.556. Um, v is equal to 5.556 meters per second. Huh. So in part B, we have not um, taken away any of the information that was already present here, but it just now specified V. So what I hope, uh, that should be actually enough information for you that, um, um, you can't just take what you did for part A and simply plug in V equals that because then it, like, that's not what the value of V is. This is the value of the V. So really in part B, what has been done is it has changed the physical situation altogether. So let me um, use the diagrams that I've drawn for part A to note where it has changed. So it, what has changed are the forces. So when I was drawing the diagram for part A, I took this to be the case, that the friction is zero. And everything I've done here is consistent with that. So now we have to consider the possibility that friction isn't zero. So, all right. So if I have non-zero friction, I have to think about what direction it'll be. And the way you figure out the direction of friction is a one, you imagine what would happen without friction. So without friction, you have a driver who is not going fast enough. So the driver will tend to kind of sli yeah, yeah, sliding inward. The question actually said, said as much, sliding uh, towards the uh, inside of the curve. So without friction, um, the kind of the car will, it'll have kind of slide along. So it always had the horizontal component. It'll now have the vertical component of acceleration as well. So after having figured out what would happen without friction, what you do then is you introduce friction in such a way to oppose what's going to happen without friction. So here, so friction can only go in the direction along the surface. So you are choosing between choice one, um, down the slope, and choice two, up the slope. So between those two choices, the, the, choice that'll, um, that, the choice that'll give you the upward component of force to oppose the downward sliding is this direction here. So you will have um, uh, a friction force that's uh, pointed that way that's uh, going to be necessary to keep the car from sliding down. So, oh, we have straight axis, which means this needs to be broken into components, so let's do that. 
I guess we need to. Um, so let me just zoom in and kind of draw in the things I need to draw. Um, so this is the X component, Y component, and oh, this angle here, that same angle. Oh, so this is the angle here. So the X component is actually adjacent. So the X component of friction will be F um, cosine theta. And the Y component will be F sine theta. This, by the way, is why you need to always uh, draw the triangle. You can't automatically go with sine and so, you know, in one, cosine is going with a Y, and in the other, uh, sine is going with a Y. You just have to draw the triangle, track the angle to the triangle, and do that. So, there being friction force will now modify my equations. So, let me go and do that. In the interest of saving time, let me just uh, move this out. And then, oops. move these out and then draw in my friction force. So um, uh, friction force is going in the negative x direction. So I have minus f cosine theta. Um, no, uh, and it has a vertical component too. So it's gonna be even, so let me erase this. I'm not gonna be able to use this anymore. <laughs> So the vertical component of friction, let me move this out so that I can. So I guess vertical component will be adding to the normal force. So it'll be plus F sine theta. Um, yeah, that's all the changes I made, I need to make. And now that I have friction, this F becomes unknown. And, uh, oh, oh, so that is, wait, is that why? So actually, I think there is enough information in the question that we can, um, um, we can solve for friction force, eliminating normal force. Now, unfortunately, that's not what the question is asking. The question is asking for the minimum coefficient of friction. So I think I'm still going to need to write down an additional equation so that I can actually switch my unknown from normal force to this uh, coefficient. So let me write that down. The, uh, when you are dealing with the minimum circumstance, what you can say is, all right, for, so for the minimum level of friction coefficient, I can say that the friction force is equal to U minimum needed times the normal force. Now, uh, when we're dealing with the static friction force, this would have been an inequality, but that for kind of mu that might be above the minimum. If you're dealing with the minimum, then the equality holds. So, so, right, so let me actually solve this for, uh, what do I wanna solve this for? Um, I guess it doesn't matter. Um, this is already solved for friction. So let me use that to eliminate friction from all my equations. So then I'm gonna be, oh yeah, so I guess I'm not switching out normal force. I'm gonna be getting rid of friction. So I'll have two unknowns then. I'll have normal force and the coefficient of friction. And then once I have that, I am going to get rid of the normal force and finally solve for the coefficient of friction. So let me do that uh, first step first. Let me uh, use equation one, sorry, uh, equation three to get my equations one and two prime. So let me clear out some space here. Um, so, uh, so by combining equation three with equations one and two, what you're going to get is, um, so I'm gonna get n sine theta minus the, instead of friction, mu mean n, mu, I'm just gonna say mu, and cosine theta is equal to m v squared over r. That's gonna be my equation one prime. My equation two becomes uh, n cosine theta plus, instead, so mu n instead of friction times sine theta uh, 
minus mg is equal to zero. Um, and that's going to be my equation to prime. So to solve for mu, it looks like the easiest thing to do is, uh, <laughs> sorry, I guess I'm, uh, I'm going to solve both equation for n, and then I can just set one equal to the other. It's a kind of uh, substitution, but uh, I, I can see this is going to get algebraically complicated. So I, let me just do it this way. So solve for n, then that gets me. So uh, solving for n here, I can factor out n. That gives me n times um, sine theta minus mu cosine theta equal to that. So divide out by this thing that gets me n. So doing all that in my head, n is equal to m v squared over r divided by sine theta minus mu cosine theta. Okay, that's a, a version of n coming from one prime, so one double prime. Let me do the same thing uh, using the second equation. So I have, once again, factoring out n, I have n times cosine theta plus mu sine theta. My, so I need to move mg over to the other side, divide out by this thing. Once I've done all that, I get n is equal to mg divided by cosine theta plus mu sine theta. That's my two double prime. All right, now I can set these two equal to each other and solve for mu. All right, low algebra. Let me just do uh, um, um, power through that and we'll be done. <laughs> Um, so setting, the, so doing that one double prime equal to two double prime, what you end up getting is mv squared over r divided by sine theta minus mu cosine theta is equal to mg divided by cosine theta plus mu sine theta. Um, so masses cancel out, that's great. And uh, I think what I'm going to do to uh, get um, kind of expression where it's easy to solve for mu is I'm going to imagine uh, multiplying this entire thing by product of basically these two things. So product of sine theta minus mu cosine theta times cosine theta plus mu sine theta. And the effect of that is on the left-hand side, this cancels out, leaving me with this. On the right-hand side, this cancels out, leaving me with this. So let me write down the version of the equation where all that has been done. And you get um, V squared over R times the thing on the right, so cosine theta plus mu sine theta is equal to g times the thing on the left, sine theta minus mu cosine theta. Now I need to collect, collect like terms, uh, by which I mean all the terms that contain mu. So let me collect them on the left-hand side and everything else on the right. So doing that gets me this. Um, on the left hand side, I have a mu times, and I'm going to write down the version where mu is already factored out. So I have sine theta v squared over r. So v squared over r sine theta, that's what was originally on the left. And I have g times cosine theta that's moved to the left. So now the minus is going to become plus, plus g cosine theta is equal to everything else gets moved to the right. So I have the thing that's already on the right, g times the sine theta. Oh, wait, wait, that, that, oh, wait, that g, yeah, g stays there. Um, <laughs> minus um, v squared over r cosine theta. v squared over r cosine theta. And um, so solving for mu, this is what I get. Mu is equal to? Um, 
I have that complicated G sine theta minus V squared over R uh, cosine theta divided by um, V squared over R sine theta plus G cosine theta. All right. It's not going to simplify anymore. The friction tends to complicate a bunch of expressions. I'm just going to leave it at there. Let me just plug in the numbers so that I can verify for you that um, the answer, I got this correct answer. So let me actually uh, copy this up where I have all the other numbers. And I have all my numbers here. Uh, in the calculator, let me just uh, do it in two steps. Uh, once for the numerator and once for the denominator. Uh, by the way, I can do this more quickly on a, a Wolfram Alpha, but uh, let me just use calculator so that I'm not taking shortcuts with the, this one where I've already taken one shortcut. I don't need to take it with the remainder. So um, I have G. Uh, I'll just use 9.8. Let me not make this complicated. <laughs> 9.8. Uh, times sine of theta, theta is 21 degrees, uh, sine of theta minus, let me do a uh, parenthesis, the speed is 5.556 meters per second squared divided by the radius, 100 times, and uh, this calculator, particular calculator actually obeys order of operation. That's why I'm doing it this way. You should know how your calculator works. So um, yeah, so 20, cosine of 21. So that'll get me, when I press equals, that'll get me the numerator. So the numerator is 3.224. Um, and the unit 2.224, and the unit technically is a meter per second squared, although that's going to cancel out, so I don't care. Um, all right, the denominator is going to be uh, V squared over R, so 5.556 squared divided by 100 uh, times 20, sine of 21 degrees, so 21 uh, sine that's the first term, plus 9.8 times cosine of 21. So 21 um, cosine is equal to 9.25, uh, so 9.260. 9.260 meter per second squared, 3.224 divided by 9.260. By the way, if I were worried about rounding issues, then I could have used the memory storage function. But that's one of the reasons we want to fix the rounding issue so that you can just keep three or four significant figures and you'll be fine. So 0 0.348, um, 0 0.348. Okay, let's plug that in. 0 0.348. Um, all right, so uh, let me just do, um, illustrate that uh, whole rounding thing being fixed. So I can actually round this to 0 0.35 and it'll grade it as correct. So uh, on the questions where we have fixed the rounding issue, we use tolerance. And the default tolerance is 1%. But on the questions that involve G, we'll set a little bit higher tolerance, well, 3%. So that if you're using G equals 10, most of the times that gets graded as correct. Uh, if you find where it doesn't, message me, let me know. I'll give you errata credit and kind of uh, fix that too.